Like a new clap. Yeah. The opening of a beer. It's Friday. I can get on board with that. I'll put my headphones in. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Conversations by the Sea. Um, I'm not sure what episode number this is now. Fifth? Six? Six, I think, yeah. Wow. Um, today is a little bit different from our past few weeks because it's just me and Ellen. Um, we, uh, I mean, mainly we just haven't really organised the guests, so. <laughs> yeah, but I also think that, like, um, I don't want it to always seem as structured and, like, I suppose mine and your, like, we're, we're, we're quite like to wing things, don't we? Like, I always, most of the time I do wing my newsletter and stuff, so I thought, like, let's just wing it this week and see what's... I got some topics I was thinking about doing when it was just the two of us anyway, so let's just chat about those things. Yeah. How's your week been? All right, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> spent with you a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't go anywhere, but... Uh... No, it's been all right this week. I think it's been a good week. I think... Um, I think we've mentioned on podcasts in the past that like that guilt between not being busy enough versus being so busy that you like knackered all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think this week we've had a better balance of that. I would say this whole month, like March as a month, like it's March twenty one now. In case you're listening in the future, but I think that um, February was like we kind of stupidly, well, I stupidly took on too many projects for us because it was a funding deadline and there was some web design deadlines, and then I just thought I'd just take them all. And then we've definitely learned my lesson from that. And I'm only going to take on one big web design project at a time now. So we've kind of got that one and then we've got our other work. And I think other freelancers will probably recognize this like fear of like the feast or famine. And you're like you turning down work or pushing back work and saying you're not available for however many weeks. It's like it never gets more. It never gets easier. I don't think. No, I, I think. I think uh, my, like my perspective on it's a bit even worse than yours because you've obviously done this longer than me mm-hmm. and I'm like oh my god every job we're saying no it was potentially us losing the house because we can't pay the mortgage because like even though that's pay. not yeah, yeah it, like I catastrophize from that mm-hmm. I mean even like last last month like a client asked us to do some extra work and I, I, we just couldn't fit it in so I just said no and then I feel like that's probably lost that extra work now for for good but like other works come in since then from yeah. other people so and i equally think that it's like about setting resetting the power struggle between clients the client and the like the contractor where sometimes you get to the point with a as a as a freelancer where the client says jump and then you say how high whereas like some you've got to put it back into perspective and say look we're actually quite busy right now if you want us to do work you need to brief us with this amount of notice and not not give short notice briefs and just be clearer in, in your requirements because it's not like there are a shortage of freelancers out there who can take on work but not everyone can take on short notice work or different kinds so obviously we do try and refer work out as well when it's possible if when if we're not available somebody else is but then sometimes there's on, a, on the other end of the spectrum you sometimes get inquiries from new clients who like you wouldn't you don't really you know red flag clients who you don't really want to work with but you equally don't want to pass them to somebody else because mm. you feel like a bit responsible for that is that my phone or is your phone? It's not very professional on the podcast. I had to turn it off, do not disturb, because I was waiting on a call from a doctor. So, Well, that's me told. Back on now, back on. So anyway, this week I want to talk, well, we can talk about whatever you want, but I was thinking we could talk a little bit about your um, previous amateur slash amateur professor, semi-professional mixed martial arts career. Oh yeah, mm, <laughs> I guess so. Oh, because yeah. um maybe people don't know who like don't know craig in this context but some people will only know craig in this context um craig was uh fighting mma when i met him uh, eight years ago and you before it was cool before conor mcgregor basically was around not before he was fighting because he's older than you isn't he a little bit yeah yeah i think he was fighting then but uh but not in the ufc he didn't really rise to prominence until just before mm-hmm. i think i'd pretty much retired by the time he was in the ufc yeah. i say retired it's not like i ever got anywhere near his level <laughs> it's not like uh not like i'm comparing myself to him but i just always say before it was cool because um i think nowadays it's a much more accepted sport and when i used to tell people i did it based on the fact that i was like quite a studious um like you know i wrote poetry and stuff like that and people were always like what cage like cage fighting because that's you know people knew it people didn't know what mma meant then 
and very few people even knew what the UFC was. And anyone who did know of a sport would just go, oh, you do that UFC, do you? You do that UFC? Mm-hmm. And I'd be like... UFC's not the I sport, guess, yeah. yeah. It's like I do. It's like saying you do premiership. Yeah. Um, I think this whole topic like ties itself up in a neat bundle of um, male mental health and like male, like because you can talk about it really, but obviously you, you movement into combat sports. I know a lot of it was around self defense and where you grew up and feeling like you know being bullied and, and weakness and then that whole and then you've written poems about you know man up and you know masculine what's the word I'm for toxic masculinity so do you want to just like maybe just talk about how what made you like first walk into the gym that time how old were you and like what made you go from being like a little little bean out on the streets just like living your life tiny little prawn craig maybe i'll put some pictures on the screen for people watching on youtube so you can see some i mean i'm pretty craig's t- highlights. i'm still pretty tiny as it is really i'm only uh like I'm i don't fat. mean like height wise <laughs> i don't mean like you're like a little waif but that ties into in, that... the walking into the gym and having the confidence to do that and like what was your motivation i mean that's it's it's kind of wrapped up in the story of my life but in brief um sort of i grew up in washington which is not the worst place in the world but it is pretty rough um especially if you're a young kid like you you sort of get jumped on the street fairly often like uncommonly often Make i would sound say. like johannesburg no but it's <laughs> like you don't well you get i mean the worst yeah, generally that happens obviously there's been a couple of stabbings and shootings and stuff but the worst that happens is you get beaten up usually um yeah but you wouldn't like walk but it's around often. it you, you wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. like, walk around at night there's some stuff. estates you just don't walk around at, at night and you and it's the kind of place where you do grow up like looking like Ellen and I were talking this week about uh, the Sarah Everard case and like it's terrible and uh, you know obviously me as a man I don't really have any I shouldn't really even be engaging in it other than to like stand up for like you know women's right to be able to walk the streets whenever the hell we want and do whatever the hell we want without fear of attack but what I was saying Ellen was I kind of understand that fear because I was always afraid growing up I was oh I hated going anywhere like having to walk anywhere even just when I was like early going out with my friends like like 15 16 i would like run home if they were like far away to yeah. make sure i didn't have to walk so past even anyone. like to preface that even though the fear isn't the same like you know you know you haven't you yeah, didn't no, have like a fear of sexual violence or no, anything like that just a fear of it's being... just the idea of walking the streets and ne- and having like look i mean it was a time before headphones i guess i mean you would have had like maybe an ipod or something but you were looking behind you all the time. You would purposefully go. I used to just pretend the main I was on the road. phone and like yeah. ring, ring me, like pretend I was talking to my mom on the yeah. phone. Yeah. Or you would like walk the the main roadway, which might have been longer rather than under a subway or something. Yeah. So so basically, yeah. What I mean is, I, I sort of grew up in fear. Um, and I uh, I was bullied a fair bit in school, and like never did anything about it because I was just like so scared of fighting. Um, mainly because I just don't understand it. Like we talked a little bit in the ADHD diagnosis about like elements of the like autistic spectrum and stuff and i'm beginning to understand that probably i am on that because i don't understand anger like i can't and i and i just can't get like violent about to anyone i don't feel violence like it just doesn't happen um so i get like confused and upset by people it's like a blocker angry at me part of your brain's like a block yeah and then i don't know i just like i was just so sick of being afraid all the time and uh one of my friends that i met through like parkour free running um, Dean, he was like a black belt kickboxer and he was like my height, my weight, but just totally fearless, you know, like people would come up, a lot of the times when you do, when you're doing like funny sports, like free running, etc. people would come up to you and like, ha- like say something or like try and have a go at you. People feel like because you're doing something that's kind of performative in the street, it's there, it gives them a right to just approach you. Yeah. And, and uh, so like Dean always used to stand up for himself and it just like impressed us. I, I like, got talking to him about how I could and he like took us along to kickboxing and when I was a, like 12, 13, I went to a boxing club in Washington, but it just, it, like, it was not good for me because, like, I, th- I remember I was sparring with a kid, like, two or three years younger than us, and he was tiny, and he's beat the hell out of me, and I, like, had to go into the changing rooms and, like, cry in frustration, and everyone, like, took the mickey, and I, like, just... Do you think that comes from, like, because me and you have both got this condition where it's, like, if you're not good at something straight away, it, it's, like, I, yeah. you get, like, upset about it. Like, I definitely get that where... Um, like natural like it, it, physical ex- exercise is not my strong suit at all like i've been running but other than that like i've never been i was always last in pe and stuff but the reason i would never try something out was because i hated that feeling of being like the worst at something because mm. it's like we're both yeah, quite I competitive I in like nature being bad at stuff which is why it surprised me when i went to that kickboxing class 
because I'd started doing the free running, which is a whole part of the story I've kind of missed out, but I started doing free running and parkour and it like it was a great sport because it kind of attracts a lot of like non sporty people to mm. it, like nerdy types. But it's actually like tremendously physical, so you end up like putting muscle on really quick yeah. and I, I ended up like putting on like a stone or more of muscle and like just becoming much, much stronger than I'd ever been. And it translated really well, so I ended up doing martial arts with Dean at the kickboxing club. But I got really interested in like uh, submission grappling, like wrestling and stuff, because I guess when I was a kid, I was always into like WWE wrestling and I just liked that like chess match nature of it. And obviously there's not as much punching in the face, which is lovely. (laughs) So I ended up going to like, I I ended up like stumbling into watching like the early UFCs and um, just thinking to myself like, wow, this is so like masculine and violent, but at the same time, I really like the sport. And uh, Dean was interested in trying it as well. So we both ended up going to this gym called Spartan in Hilton Castle in Sunderland. And I, d- I remember very well actually walking into it for the first time because it was this like small gym, like out of a converted church. You walked in and like straight away you were into the like main bit and it had a little cage in it in the middle at the time. It changed later, but uh, it had a little small cage in the middle and like bags on the outside. And then the back room was like the MMA room um, and it was all matted out. And I remember, like, the first session I did, like, the sweat from the previous session was, like, in the air, like, <laughs> mist, um, and, like, catching on the roof and dripping back down, like, oh rain. <laughs> and all the lads at the, like, big advanced MMA session were just, like, huge beasts. And then, like, I went to the beginners with Dean. How old were you, sorry? 18, I think. Okay. 18, 19, maybe. Um, but tiny still for mm-hmm. my, like, height and weight. Uh, I, was, I was always one of the smallest in Spartan. But... Really quickly, I got I realized I was good at grappling, like really good at grappling, and I like really outpaced like the beginners class and got invited to the advanced in like a few weeks. And I I said to Paul at the time, who was like the Paul was a kickboxing coach, and Warren was the like MMA coach. But I think if I remember correctly, Warren only coached the like advanced. Um, and I think Paul was doing the beginners classes. But anyway, I got asked to go to the advanced, and I held back, like I asked to hold back until Dean could come with us because I just didn't want to step into that room of beasts without my friend. Uh, so I waited and then me and Dean ended up in the advanced class. And to be honest, after that, I just never really looked back. Like I uh, I just got into the routine and like going back to the ADHD thing, I think it became like my special interest type of focus for so many years. Yeah. And, you know, I just, it was all I wanted not to do. Not just the sport, but like the, uh, like not just the doing of the sport, but you've always been a keen follower of the sport as well. So yeah. even now when... You you not you call yourself retired or semi retired or whatever, and I know you still train Muay Thai, but um, pretty much every day I see you checking like the MMA Reddit and like you know all yeah, it's the only sport I'm, it's it's I'd say it's the only sport that I'm interested in really. Mm-hmm. Other than like obviously I follow kickboxing, like combat sports is all I really follow. Um, I think what really surprised me was the camaraderie. Like yeah, people often say you know like people often have this assumption that like especially back then before like the conor mcgregor like popularization mm-hmm. of it and the reebok deal that like standardized the uniforms back in the like back in the day like cage fighting was like bald-headed tribal tattooed like nutcases and there was people that looked like that in the gym and they turned out to be some of the nicest people i've ever met yeah like the, the bond of people in that gym was so strong at the time like it's it's a shame now looking back that we don't really see each other anymore but the like because it was a relatively small gym as well the team was small so mm-hmm. you know sometimes i'd be going to classes and there'd just be like eight of us or something with the coach and you just end up performing like a family and uh it was great for me because it was through kind of my formative years like i didn't it took me a while to kind of grow up and i think between like probably i did the majority of my growing up during those mma days mm-hmm. between like 18 and 22 ish yeah um and then obviously I, once i met ellen i sort of slowed down because i guess i did that traditional thing where you get comfortable with your girlfriend and you, you i think mma requires like the level that i was trying to pursue at the time required and enti- like total focus you couldn't really do anything else like all i did was work in a little bar job um for three days a week so that i could fund training four or five days a week and living with your parents yeah and stuff, lived so, with my parents yeah. so there was no way i could have unless i'd made it to the ufc which was very unlikely because i was good but i wasn't that good um i don't think i could have ever really kept it training so enough. sorry to know because you were going like too far into the future i wanted to ask you about uh well first thing you obviously already touched on like how you felt like 
you were it was the first time that you were faced with you couldn't misconception like your maybe inherent classes or misconceptions like about certain like you would see people on the street and you would maybe have made a judgment about them and then when you actually started becoming friends with those types of people you were like well they're actually like the best people that you can have on your side and now lots of them have got kids and families and wives and and you think you know you, even though you don't speak to them you still feel like that affinity with them yeah I think, and that I was think like the first time childhood. where you were like you made like met people that outside of your circle i think i could reach out to any of them now and ask them for a favor and they do it for us and the same goes each way because you kind of you know when you sweat and bleed with people mm -hmm. like literally bleed with people you, you you become like bonded in a way that's really hard to explain um and i also think another part of the surprising aspect of it is that actually the people that go the, the really like nasty people who assault people on the streets and stuff don't stay in sports like that yeah they can't they don't have the commitment so so what you get is maybe yeah the people maybe like look intimidating but actually the people that stay in martial arts tend to be you know creative like inquisitive smart really intelligent people mm -hmm. that stay in the sport for it like different reasons than the to just be tough and yeah. friendship do you think that on that note do you think that like the sport in itself it has a i would say has a better reputation now than it maybe did back then because it's seen as a more commercially viable sport and you've got joe rogan's podcast and you know and people see that guy and think oh he's the you know past he, he still commentates on mma doesn't he mm -hmm. and like people he's, it's more mainstream is what i'm saying but back then it seemed a bit underground and then like do you think that where was i going with that oh you're kind of you were kind of there along from it going from underground to to mainstream and then like you've mentioned the Reebok deal when obviously fighters went a lot had their own sponsorships after that and you know the big Conor McGregor kind of turning point where he became would you say would you agree that that was like his kind of he kind of became this godlike figure and what what did you did you feel like things changed in the gym during that time like do you feel like people started coming to the gym thinking that they could give it a go or or was it still very much like a time what's the word like a, like time warp inside well, of spartan to be honest i think i stopped training in like maybe like 2016 ish at spartan mm -hmm. um because i like when i when i got that earlier i mentioned like meeting ellen was a slowdown in training but that wasn't why i stopped or anything <laughs> of course not uh, i would never blame you for that it was that uh like once i got a full-time career in marketing I just didn't have the you, hunger You had anymore. jobs in different locations as well, where at one point you were working in Cramlet and living in Gosforth and Driving the gym was in Sunderland, Sunderland yeah. and it was really difficult for you. It would take you, up yeah. my whole day. Um, but, so I, I probably stopped, like, when that, like, wave of popularity really began. Um, I'd kind of stopped from then. Would, you know, like, early on, I, I think 2015-ish, I think Connor had had a few fights in the UFC and he was already starting to, like, pick up loads of pace. And yeah, we're seeing like newer people, but I think that the difference now is that like you see so much more opportunity for fighters in like there's I feel like there's way more like good level organizations to get into it at a grassroots level, like mm -hmm. in the UK and for Northeast fighters. Whereas back then you kind of had your local shows. You had the UFC, which was like super hard to get into and you could only get in through like that reality show that they did the ultimate fighter. Yeah. And like if you were scouted and then like cage warriors was like big but not yeah not as big as like bellator seems to be now i don't know it's hard to say because i don't really follow yeah. the figures anymore but i just think the sport seems so much more legitimate now yeah like it seems like a legitimate sport whereas maybe back when i started it was more of a like underground thing mm -hmm. it wasn't at the time like I, st I started the first ufc i watched was ufc 100 so it's like it wasn't you know it wasn't new mm -hmm. then do you think that um like the rise of combat sports in the in the mainstream so particularly the ufc like things that nowadays most people most like a lot of lads our age or what or, or, or women like a lot of people have watched the ufc and they know it do you think that um that has the given people what like i'm trying to reflect this back on like male mental health and how like often there isn't really like an outlet for if you're not into like football and that's your own that's the only kind of viable way to hang or be around other men in a group and like i don't know it's not my place to say but i'm just trying to say that like it 
men aren't the same as women where they just go and hang out young men don't often go out and hang out in groups and just exist together or go to each other's houses and stuff like women do this is might be a generalization but often i feel like men have to like go to a thing to do a thing yeah I, yeah I, I think that's probably fair like um and then also the vi- like the violence aspect because at the end of the day it is a violent sport even you know it's a combat sport even if it's not even if you know people it's not as violent as boxing it still involves hitting people and there's still blood it's funny though because i don't i don't think that it's violent but like i think violence happens as a result of the like the sport but it's not like a i don't know i don't think like no no like high level mma fighter wins because they're violent like they, it's not about that it's about like being just better at what you do than your opponent. But you can't like, ignore the like the head yeah, injuries yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff. It's dangerous, as I guess as a dangerous is a better, is a better word. Yeah, I, think. I mean, it, yeah, it, it, you're right. In some ways, it is violent, but it's not. I don't think that the sport's about violence. Um, is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. And like, I was never violent ever. And like, even my first fight, I'll talk about my first fight. That's what this, I was probably. about to ask for. So like, well, let's well since you've been talking about local shows and your first fight. I mean, all of your fights were local shows. Is that right? Yeah. So do you want to talk about, I know you've written a piece in the past, like an actual, like, like kind of first hand experience of what it's like to walk into the cage the first time. But I think maybe the listeners will be interested because not everybody walks into a cage and yeah. fights somebody that they've never met before after a weight cut and an eight week training camp. So even though it seems like run in the mill, maybe to you, it's not run in the mill to most people. So do you want to no, talk I, about that? I don't think it seems run of the mill. I, I think every fight was like a really big... I know, but because combat sports are your daily life like and you still train now yeah that if you forget how a lot of people are even the idea of going to a show would be like well i'll try and explain so like imagine you've been training in this sport for like i think at the time it was like a year and a half or something maybe two years and like you know you're still terrified of like anyone on the streets like trying to start a fight with you or you know like i just started like i think i was like 19 20 maybe 20 so i'd started like I'd, i was out going out to bars and stuff and i just hated anyone trying to start fights and stuff i always tried to get away from it i was afraid and then i was out you were afraid of getting like embroiled in a fight or you were afraid of fight. having to defend like what was your like no fear? getting getting embroiled in a fight like i always just think like i don't really attach any logic to like what will happen i just don't want to get involved in fights yeah i hate it okay i think it's probably a good segue now to talk about your first fight so yeah right so so right i'd been training for like two years at the time and i was sitting i remember really well i was sitting in a uh indian take like an indian restaurant with my mom and a uh, girlfriend at the time and uh I had a was it concord tangerine no it wasn't it was uh, <laughs> the last days of the garage on low fell oh right yeah and, uh, <laughs> and i was i got a, I had a text off me on my phone off my coach saying you want to fight uh you want to fight <laughs> and i was like just to remember like the, the panic you know you know that like fight or flight response feeling where just your stomach drops out and i was just like <gasps> need the toilet <laughs> and i ended up i just like walked out and rang him and i was like yeah i do yeah but i'm like do you think i'm ready and he was like of course you are yeah definitely and i was like oh my god so it was at an event at the time that was called i can't it had two names and i can't remember which one it was when i fought but it used to either Is that be on called, youtube that one no no it's facebook um, it was like a Facebook video that Adam Lister recorded for us. And it's still there somewhere. But uh, it was uh, at the Fed Breweries. And it was called oh, Either Supremacy or Strike and Submit. And uh, so I, I like was stepped up my training for like eight weeks. Really, like, really stepped it up. And it was really hard work. Um, we would do things like shark tanks where you're like the only person in the circle and everyone else is fresh. So you like they come in, do two minutes sparring with you they go out you stay and they come in. so you're always getting fresh men mm-hmm. so it just like tires you so quick so for people that haven't trained in that kind of environment before you're, you're training people of all shapes and sizes it's like the whole gym mm-hmm. not just people your weight or your age it's well bearing like in everybody. mind everyone was bigger I mean, than but, me yeah, as well yeah <laughs> but like you were like used to wrestling against people who were yeah, 80 even kilos, like heavyweights and kilos, stuff yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I was always against like big heavy strong guys and uh but then the actual like the fight came around and sorry I... just so for the the fight camp itself the eight week thing that was that like because i know when i know when we met and you did a fight camp you didn't drink and you ate relatively well and then you did a weight cut did you do a weight cut for your first one 
No, I was like... Um, you were already at the I was pretty, I mean, like, or whatever it was. I, thought, I think I fought at 62 and I weighed 61 uh, just because of all the extra training I was doing. Like, mm-hmm. I was always a little scrawny kid anyway. But, uh, I, and I like would run and stuff on a night time because mm-hmm. I always thought like he's probably running so I best run. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it was... Uh, and did we, you know who this guy was? Like who you were going to fight? No, just that he was a debut as well. So it was his oh, first... Oh, so, okay. It so was you his didn't like have too. to look him up or anything like that? I didn't know anything about him except his name. Um, and then like the fight came around even though like I would... Uh, like every night I was losing sleep over it and everything. I just was Thinking like, oh my God, what... Might not want to do it, but like you did. I really wanted to do it. I was just thinking about all the different ways I could potentially lose, mm-hmm. and that was always that was always what was I was your biggest about. worry: losing or getting hurt? Losing, losing. I wasn't bothered about getting hurt. I never thought about it. I just thought about losing because I didn't want to lose. I, I think that's probably the biggest. Was that element. because you didn't want to disappoint other people, or because you didn't want to disappoint yourself? Myself. Or both? Yeah. I think it's competitive. I think the whole thing with combat sports for me is my competitiveness. I think it's the ultimate form of competition because it's hand to hand kind of well, against like, another it's man it's like the last answer isn't it like you know if i think something deep down in everyone is like maybe weighing up like could could this person beat me in a fight or not and stuff and like competition is like <laughs> i don't know every you're like every person no i like, don't well probably eh, not probably not really every person that. but yeah. i think like you know you like your, your lizard brain your ancient brain is probably like could this person beat me up or yeah. not like um and my like, dad could be your dad yeah in the comment in like <laughs> I think, like, the thing I love most about combat sports is, like, after the combat sport is finished, because no animosity because, you know, you've done mm-hmm. it. Whereas, like, in a football disagreement, it ends up in a fight. You get what I mean? Like, whereas, it, whereas in a fight, yeah. the fight ends and your unless friends, you shake hands. Unless it's McGregor versus the, uh, Khabib. Yeah, unless it's something like that, yeah. <laughs> but that went way beyond. That was stupid. Oh. That, like, the stuff he was saying Out about the crowd was and stuff. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the stuff Connor was saying about Khabib, you mean? yeah. It was just like, I mean, it was racist, really. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, I'm just, now we're going to get like... Now we're going to, yeah, we'll get any, any, like, any fans McGregor that, fans will like, come eh. like, hey, you don't even like... Uh. But uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, so yeah, you're walking out, uh, you, you I, well, put yeah, we went to, Well, we went to the event, the, okay. the, 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 the place in like the Federation Breweries is like a, well, an old brewery and then there's like a Lancastrian suite inside of it and it's like a sort of old like social clubby type of place you get like white collar box and fights yeah. and stuff there so i went in and i was like i went in earlier in the day uh talking about fighting cut a bit of my thumb off no, um, just bled your thumb everywhere. yeah and i uh i'm just trying to picture it again like went in and i was by myself at the time because it was just for the wins mm-hmm. and like no one had made it yet so i just went in and did my way and you weigh in on the same day and i saw my opponent is that right i and, and he was like smaller than me but like bigger i thought like hencher wider and i just and he looked like the kind of kid that would have beaten us up on the street mm-hmm. and i remember just being like terrified of him and then i realized like i i think i like realized at one point like he was looking at me and i was like he's scared of me mm-hmm. and i remember just being like so per- perplexed by that because i've never had like i just never thought like someone would ever and i was like oh he's just as frightened as i am yeah and uh and then like my coach ended up coming and we like he took a look at him and he was like because i text my coach i remember i text my coach saying like oh my god warren he's like a little mini hulk or something i'm scared <laughs> and then uh like when warren came he was like you you must be blind or something this is gonna be easy and uh and then we went backstage and started warming up and at the time i was i think i was uh fighting alongside a, a teammate um can't remember if this was the same fight but anyway i didn't i didn't warm up ago and i was like warming up and that and i just remember being like sick with nerves and i was like oh my god this is so terrifying and you're warming Did you warming up have and any like, like friends or family come with that one no i always i think every fight i always told my family not to come and mm-hmm. uh friends wise i just had like people from my gym i didn't really want anyone to come and see us lose i mm-hmm. wanted to like see how i was first but uh because of like the parkour thing i had loads of people watching online it was getting streamed online wow. which back then i was gonna say i know yeah, not 10 many, years ago yeah not, not many people were uh doing that back then and and even since uh, other events never really managed to get it done mm-hmm. that well whereas that one event our first fight event was streamed it really well online to a point where oop, to a point where like i say someone got a got captured a video of it that i still got now mm-hmm. and uh yeah i just remember walking past all these people to like get to the like walkout area because it was like all the seating the cage was in the middle and then it was like a stage at the back it's quite crowded there isn't so it? you had like, to go around yeah. the people and go to the back right, and i've gone around loads of people like i had my gloves on and my, my like my t-shirt my shorts and that and my cup and my gum guard in 
and like all the like drunken audience were like reaching out and like tapping us and being like come on because i think i was the first fight of the yeah. night and uh because it only goes like and, the, and there was like loads of people just like saying good luck and i was like oh my god oh my god i can't believe this is happening to me and i think i started to like depersonalize it a bit and just like float away from who i was yeah so i like ended up like in the backstage and i'd like made my own song as well because uh i really like this skrillex dubstep song but it took too long to start and it used to, it's called equinox first of the year and it, it i think the, so did you have that song from day one yeah so the bass drop starts with like call 911 now but i cut that out with like windows movie maker or something <laughs> And put this oh, is Sparta from 300 in because of yeah. the Spartan gym. And I thought that was cool as hell. And uh, so I was like standing at the back and I had like Warren and Paul in my corner and I think Tom Robson. And uh, he was like a training partner. But uh, I always respected him. He's a cool guy. And uh, I just remember like standing there. And even now talking about it, I can remember the nerves. And I was just like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe this. How, how is this happening to me? but I really wanted it as and, well. And yeah, I was going to say, at no point at that, you were thinking no, I'm going to flake. Ne- there you was were never like, a part yeah. where I thought, like, oh, I don't want it. Like, I'm not going to go in. Yeah. I, just, I, I was just like, what's go- like what is going to happen? And then, uh, so I took, a, like, my music came on and I and then I was like, right, and it was like, oh, this is, but I was like, right. And I got a bit of like, <laughs> you know, got my blood up a little bit because yeah. I was like, yeah, this is the song I've been like, listening to, it was like myself up. So I like walked down the thing and I, I, I didn't look at them or anything and I just like kept my head down because I hate all that, like, false macho like mm-hmm. staring each other out crap so i just like look down like even on the video i think you can see us and i'm like looking at the floor and if i can I, find it i'll link it in the description I, and then i briefly like look up and like acknowledge him and i think i just went like like you all right mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of like jim from the office i think i was like <laughs> and uh like hey and, how did we he end was, up here and he was like staring at us like dancing back and forwards like us doing all this yeah. crap and i turned away and just like leant down and i was just chatting in my corner and uh, they were just like, come on, Craig, like, you've got this easy, man, easy. And, that. and then I turn around and like, it was touch gloves time. Like the ref brings in the middle and he like, he like says some instructions like you're never here because you just like, and uh, goes over the rules and that. And like we touch gloves and it was an old form of rules that doesn't exist anymore called semi-pro where you wore the professional MMA gloves, which are four ounce gloves. So essentially you're basically bare knuckle um, and you couldn't hit on the floor but you wore those gloves whereas now the amateur rules are like you wear bigger gloves and can't hit on the floor yeah so fight started and honestly i don't remember it at all but i've watched the video loads of times Mm -hmm. since then so i know what happened but i don't really remember the fight and can't remember any of my fights i think something happens where like your adrenaline just completely takes over um i briefly remember that fight though because it was a woman in the in like sitting in the side on my corner who'd like while i was standing talking to my coaches she was like she'd like looked at my name because the guy had said it and she was like i'm gonna i'm gonna root for you craig come on craig come on craig and she and she <laughs> just didn't know you but yeah, she was but like shouting said, but she'd said something like oh like like he looks nice like let's root for him because i obviously like was just some guy and then this other guy was like angry and that and i was well, like you were just a boy really you weren't even like a guy much, who would just look like yeah. a really i had like my head boy, shaved yeah. as well but like not bald but like you know i just had that like young yeah. look about us and then uh, i went out and touched gloves and then i just uh I think we started and he like threw a couple of like big I could tell he was dead nervous and he threw like a big overhand right mm-hmm. and I like blocked it and hit him and I just th- remember thinking like oh, oh that was this easy this is just what I've been training yeah, for yeah that was easy yeah. and, and then he was smaller than me which is a novelty really because I'm pretty short mm-hmm. uh, so I like threw a head kick to try and just like see how that would work and it hit him and I didn't expect that either and I remember being like surprised by hitting yeah. him and feeling a bit bad about it but it only you're supposed to hit with a shin and it, I just slapped him with my foot and then I like rest like we ended up he he tried to take me down mm-hmm. and I like grabbed a hold of him took him down instead and then like wrestled him into a submission and he tapped out and uh I was just so happy like a relief that like washed over us and like how long did the fight last like a minute or something mm-hmm. not, not very long and uh it was great and and like everyone was just like you know you had the like ring girls coming mm-hmm. in for the photos and like all this stuff and like everyone's cheering for you and it's just like the ultimate feeling in the world and uh the ref raises your hand and that and then your team come in and they congratulate you and his team come in you like commiserate them and stuff and uh and then later in like i went back up to get changed and that and then later in the night uh ian freeman who's like a famous like he was fought in the ufc and he, he was commentating on that fight and commentates on a lot of the fights in the northeast uh like picked me to be like performance of the night oh wow so i'd like won my little fight trophy uh-huh. for the fight 
and I'd won my fighter of I won like fighter of the night. Mm-hmm. It was just amazing. I was like, what a fighter of the night on the first yeah. fight I've ever had. And uh yeah, and then I watched when I watched it back the commentators were saying like how impressed they are with like how slick I looked and stuff. And it was just great because I You were like unfazed, like kind of Yeah, because it, it never you know, it never like occurred to me that I could do it and like after that first fight it was just great. And uh, So then you had seven fights in total is that right yeah seven fights i won six and lost the last mm-hmm. one which you were at yeah <laughs> um, clearly a so, bad luck token there no i won ones while you were there yeah i just think my head wasn't in it anymore by then so uh we've talked for a while so i don't want to like go on too much about it but i do want to ask about like so then you kind of repeatedly went on and had fights all in the local area similar kinds of instances where you always won in the first round yep um some within seconds and then came to your last fight that you had so do you want to talk a little bit about that because there's a comp a very big comparison between winning in the first your first fight in the first minute and getting you you know fire of the night to like your your last last fight is in your most recent fight slash your first loss yeah i think it was it's it's kind of a bad thing and it leaves a bad taste in my mouth because i i stopped fighting after that and you, like I should never. You stop competitive it, fighting, but you're it, still training. It looked yeah. like I, it looked like I quit because I lost, but it, but that wasn't why I quit. I quit. I quit because I lost the fight before the fight ever happened. I mean, you know, you, were, you mm-hmm. like I lived with you at the time. Um, by then, I, like me and Ellen had moved in together, and like she said, that that, that was when I was working in Cramlington, driving back down to the gym in uh, Sunderland, and then driving home to Gosforth. So like, mm-hmm. my day would start at, like seven and finish it like 10 at night when i got home and like all i would do is work and train and it was a for a, like a tournament event where i was gonna have to, if you were to win it you would have had to fight twice in the night potentially three times if it was like tiebreakers and stuff and it just messed with my head like knowing that i might have to fight twice just was weird like i couldn't really get my head around it um and then it the was f- also about like a drama because this, so it was four fighters so two fight two like they're fighting each other and then the winner of those fights are fighting against each other mm-hmm. but one of the four people had dropped out. Yeah, and then uh, a guy and came in that I've beaten and, a yeah, few and times. Someone who you'd in. already beaten her came in. So that kind of was a bit of a like, what's going on? And then when you went on the night, I think, like you say, you just mentally weren't. You met, I remember very vividly, like mentally we were in a bad place, both of us with quite a bad depression. Yeah. Um, you were in a job where it seemed like it was supposed to be a job that you really wanted to do. It's your first ever copywriting job, but it was also like you know not you didn't enjoy it no uh, you know no, I didn't and enjoy it. it was also really far away like not geographically but just car when you're in the car and you've got to go from north of the time to south of the time all the way through sunland every day or three days a week plus the weekends like you never rest yeah and uh yeah i think i just beaten myself before the fight ever took place and then obviously like you you were there and saw the fight uh, i fought a guy who still he's a professional mma fighter now he's called adam bramhald and he uh he's really good he's really slick um but to be honest i thought like if i'd been more aggressive and less like i am i would have beat him easily in the first round because i took his i, I took him down and i uh i say i took his back as if that's something you understand but if you've never seen the sport you have no idea what i mean but basically i had you know like i managed to wrestle to a position where i was on physically on the guy's back and usually all you do is put a choke on and you know like rear tap out and that's the end uh, make it sound so easy <laughs> and it, and i had i had i remember it really well i had adam's back and i could have choked like I, I couldn't quite get the choke on because he mm-hmm. he was fighting it really well he knew what he was doing but if i'd been more merciless i would have just put it around his face and just squeezed really hard and yeah. every like you know if you get it if you squeeze hard enough and you've got it at like, the right the angle not on, even yeah. if the choke's not on they'll tap but I just didn't because I didn't really want to hurt so, him. So, yeah, so let's segue <laughs> into, like... Well, didn't want to hurt him. Talk, yeah, let's just talk a little <laughs> bit about, rather than going into the details of the fight. So, basically, you won your first fight on that night and then the second fight you fought Adam and, and lost. No, against... I didn't win my first fight on that night. Oh, no, sorry. Adam yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam was the first, yeah. Fought and then and Adam went on to fight a- um, Aiden, and... Aiden and then Aiden won. Yeah. So, um, what I was going to say is that, like, obviously, in, in order to be somebody who's successful at combat sports you have to deal with the fact that you are causing pain to somebody else like you are hurting somebody else even if it's in a con- really controlled environment and the ambulance guys are there and you're doing stuff that's going to heal within days it's still you're still causing suffering to somebody else so 
how do you like mentally cope with that like knowing that you know well i guess i don't like that's why I yeah lost. like that <laughs> hit, hit you know kick someone as hard as you can in the liver like the pain that that creates i think with striking it's not like i mean i'm gonna find this out because when when things go back to normal i intend to do at least one more fight in something probably muay thai yeah um but i think with like some things it's more obvious than others like it's like i think grappling it's really easy to not to count that as not really like a it's why all my wins were by submission because i would much rather just take someone down and tap them out yeah i think most people would agree that like yeah taking some being like taking someone and like choking them it seems more calculated and less violent than like forcefully kicking can you kick at that level yeah you can kick but you can't knee and elbow well you can knee yeah knee but you can't because i remember one point Adam need me and it just like sucked the life out of us in the second round and I was just like Ugh, I don't even want to be in here this Brex but I didn't want to like get knocked out so I just kept like backing away and yeah I think yeah if it's hard it's hard to like hit someone in anger for me like really hard I don't really like to do it for me it's I, I can go really hard in like if, if for instance when you're training in the gym if you're sparring hard and they're hitting you hard you can hit them back hard and it's but like you know them it's as kind well. of an accepted like an accepted violence but if it's in like a cage there's been times i've hit people and then gone like sorry like in fights <laughs> like because i've been like oh that was hard you know what i mean like it's it's like i'm not really built for it yeah i think i love the sport but i think a conclusion is that i was never made to be like a professional because i just i'm not really built for violence like i love the sporting aspect of it but i don't really like hurting people so let's just end the well we're gonna get we're just over 40 minutes now so um i want to end the podcast on a lighter note and maybe we'll do a whole episode about what well, we will and do a whole episode about when we quit our jobs to go traveling and um so back in 20, 2018 we quit our jobs um in june flew to thailand one way ticket in july and we spent six six months traveling southeast asia and then we did australia for a bit and um obviously we've talked about what happened in australia and how i came home but i want to talk about when we were in thailand this is just a much lighter note so craig hadn't fought prof- hadn't fought competitively for a few a good few years when was your last one 2016 so two years 2015 I think. 2015 three years but you had been training but then obviously you were in spent six months in thailand and then you weren't training we were just drinking every day in southeast asia drinking the not bin tang high pot eh okay um what was the beer in thailand chang drinking chang um cocktails just sitting on the beach eating dragon fruit living our lives and then we went to a very popular kind of party island called Koh Phi, which you've probably been to if you've been to thailand because it's like everyone's been to Koh Phi. um just between phuket and lanta and oh harmony's here as well everyone's coming in and in pb there is a um combat like what is it it's like a thai boxing it's bar like a, yeah it's like a thai boxing bar it's called reggae reggae bar i think and uh or something like that is reggae. it yeah yeah and uh reggae it's quite famous for like because like you get loads of like fucking drunk people. so basically you can fight anybody else anyone can fight anybody in, it's a ridiculous concept i don't know in how the, it works in, there's, a, there's a boxing ring in the middle of the bar and there's a guy that's claiming to be the referee and people can just fight each other in the bar and everyone else just stands and watches and you win a bucket of alcohol and you win a big bucket of alcohol if you win the fight there's no just for doing the fight oh just for doing it there's not really any uh health and safety there's no first aiders there's no like situation where it's really stupid you'd have to be stupid to fight you would have to yeah so we're in there craig's Craig's, (laughs) Craig's getting like there's actually a video of on youtube so i'll link that below okay so you're in this bar in um kopi b and kind of knew that this was like a thing you had your eye on because this is you've obviously brought us to this bar for a reason well i wanted to see what it was about and it's always a drunken tourists fighting each other and like the thing is that technically it's for like technically you can you can fight thai rules or thai boxing you know like like kicking and punching but everyone's only punching because it's mostly europeans so there's like this bunch of like raws i guess like hong kong like yeah there's like british lads who live in hong kong who are like you know wealthy kids like raw like rugby kids who think it's a really good idea to just uh like don the gloves and you get these like crappy gloves this like head thing did you get a mouth guard no no but i can't remember no no i don't think you did did you take your mouth guard with you no 
No, I think I was gonna, and then I was like, nah, that's a stupid thing. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not gonna fight. So these lads, anyway, were like, they were so drunk they could barely walk. Like, it was actually really dangerous. Like, we can laugh about it now because I'm assuming that they're okay. But, like, one of them couldn't even stand up and he was getting, like, yeah, the shit kicked it's out of him. crazy that that's allowed to happen. Like... Because one punch when you're that drunk is just gonna kill you, isn't it? It was, anyway, watching this, so we're sitting in, we're sitting quite in the front of the bar, drinking our Changs. Um, they, the, the men and the waitresses are constantly going around trying to, like, regale you into fighting and they're Especially looking at because it was quite quiet as yeah well, like, and they're looking there. at craig and they're going like they can see his ears and they can see like they're going like hmm like are you gonna fight are you gonna fight and he was like maybe i had a cocktail and like two and, chunks by yeah now, like. and you're like saying like maybe and then um this uh guy walks in this black guy walks in actually doesn't he this like massive guy he was terrifying and he was like i'll fight someone and everyone was and they were going around going do you want to fight anyone and you were like nah he wasn't, right. but he wasn't even drinking or anything he just walked with in with a bottle of water asked for a fight mm-hmm. there was clearly something dodgy going on he there was he was definitely, really scary he's definitely yeah. just coming in to chin someone so i just said no because no, that's stupid yeah. like and then there was this other guy on the other side of the ring we could see him and he was like russian looking i don't know he was like he was like calling everyone out, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, he was like, asking and, a he was fight. Like, where, he was wearing what looked like an old like boxing robe, but it didn't turn out to be a guy. Yeah. It turned out to be one of them like crappy tight white like, shirts. In our minds, might. I think we had created to be like this and like, yeah. and, like staring over everyone. He was also everyone. sitting high up, and so I it looked he like massive. he was really big. And he had this like blonde like supermodel girlfriend. Anyway, and he was and Craig was like looking around. And he asked him to fight a couple of times. Like the way Eric asked me, I had asked said that guy over there wants to fight you, and Craig was like, nah, nah. And then eventually we saw him stand up. And he went to the toilet and I saw him standing outside the toilet and he lit up a tab, a, like a cigarette, and he started smoking. And he was the same height as Craig and skinny. And I was like, yeah. I was like, y-. and Craig was like, I'll fight him. As soon as we seen him yeah. light up a tab, it was almost like, like as soon as the cigarette was lit, I was like, all right, okay. Yeah, and he realized that he wasn't massive. So and he went to the loo, he came back out and he was like, oh, that kid will fight you. And then you before, like, he ran, within he, seconds. He, he came up to us straight away and, like, dr- like obviously backed down because he was like, he, he didn't he go, have you, have you he trained was like, before? Oh, have you trained before? And I was just honest. I was like, yeah, for years. And he was like, oh, I, I, I never have, never. And then we got into But the... why is he in a bar in Thailand challenging people? Oh, well, he's totally lying anyway. I know that, but he the... was like challenging people to fights and then being like, I've never trained. I'm like, mm, right, okay. Again, we got into the ring and like, obviously they make you put this, all like, this horrible crappy, old dirty, like, people's like, gear on. Yeah, no yeah. groin guard or yeah, anything, yeah. which is terrifying. And like no gum shield. And about. there's no rules because it's not Head clear. Gear, which is the worst. It's not clear if it's like boxing or Thai boxing. It's meant to be Thai boxing. Yeah, we don't, tell you, we don't tell you what you can what do. What you can do, yeah. But uh, anyway, it was nice because it was like it was nice. Well, in the end, it was it was like the most comfortable fight I've had because one, I'd had a couple of beers, <laughs> so I was just chill. Two, I knew for a fact that I could beat him. Mm-hmm. And three, I agreed with him beforehand because I could tell how scared he was. That like, even though he was calling everyone out, so I don't. Know it was a bit of an uh, exhibition but, fight. But like, I just yeah. said to him like, well, it was an I'm not gonna, fight, I'm just yeah. gonna hit you as hard as you hit me. So just do whatever you want, and like, you know, I'm not gonna go wild. And then everything like when I hit him, I would back off. Mm-hmm. But all I did was I just kept putting like. But because we'd all just sat through those absolute idiots, idiot Englishmen, like born in uh, like born in England, raised in Hong Kong, like those kids fighting each other and just doing such a terrible job of it, the the crowd were like super excited to see people who could actually yeah. hold a stance. So, okay, so he said he couldn't, he'd never trained, but then he was like fighting us in a kickboxing stance and throwing kicks and spinning back fists mm-hmm. and stuff. So he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, but yeah, I remember just like just like hitting them and then backing away and like nodding at them and being like all right like like it was fine i eh? it was good I, I i just remember like it was just giving the crowd i just what they like wanted, i just it? kept repeatedly like kicking them and then by like the, the last kick in the last like the single were going to be three one minute rounds or something and then in the end like when ellen watched the video back i should have recorded it they were like leaving the rounds on for like five minutes each yeah, or something. Yeah, the video is actually so, like, quite long. You can so, like, like skip through. Clearly, like, yeah. must have liked. But I, it was funny. It was a funny old uh, thing that. So yeah, sorry, sorry, mom, that I did that because that was a very stupid I thing to like do. I feel like that night would like gotten on like rang your mom being like, "Hey, this just happened." Oh no, I don't think anyone knew it happened until I put the video up on YouTube because we were like vlogging the whole trip. And then I, I wouldn't have done it on. had you not looked at me that night and being like yeah you easily well that's kind of like now you're trying to shift the way no, on no, me because no, no, if you like, beat the shit out no, of I, want, I wanted to do it but like i think you having the confidence in me to just do it as well and like we were both i remember when i came back to the court because you were like in my court like you were like there and i like, came back to the corner yeah. after the first round and someone was saying something to oh you, yes oh, as soon as like the foot craig went up there there's like a lady next to me with like like a partner and like obviously it was the tourist spot there's no thai people in this place no. <laughs> except the people that work there it's like a total tourist trap and this woman was like like is he good will he win i was like yeah like because obviously i'd sat through 
I'd been to two of your fights in person here in England and I'd also been seeing the other ones on YouTube and like this was and you had like I, I it, it was like the equivalent of somebody I know you weren't a professional fighter but it was a bar where people were going in and just being like oh hey, and then you were just like going up there and I was like he's gonna be fine unless this kid turns out to be yeah you know like a real life you, you fight, fight I mean I didn't person. underestimate the kid because at the end of the day if you're sitting in a bar and calling people out yeah. for fights you must know something that other people don't because I and would, he also, I would never have called anyone out it, in that bar. I think the other thing that put us off at first, because I guess it was a joint decision, because if I had said no, you wouldn't have fought, but um, was that he wasn't drinking? I don't think. No, he wasn't. He didn't drink. And because um, because I asked because we were talking about it just before we fought, and he was like, "Oh, I don't drink," and I and I was like, "Oh, well, can I have your bucket when you when you finish?" <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, yeah," and he never gave us a good dick. <laughs> I think he gave it to his last. I never. But did. it was when we seen him smoking that was when we thought, "Oh, well, like I suppose he couldn't." In my in our minds, he wasn't any kind of serious athlete. If he was smoking, not that obviously, if anyone. Not that I was considering. I had like three or four beers. Yeah, I know that was <laughs> so like judgmental of us to say that when we were sitting there drinking beer and we had drank beer like every night for the last three months because it was our sec. Was it? I oh, know it was our first ride round, first tour around Thailand, but like well into the first one. So I guess yeah. it was like August time. Anyway, whatever dates on the video. So yeah. uh I mean that was that was uh, that was that. But do you wanna end on um we've actually talked longer than I thought would anybody who wants to anyone who's listening, male or female, who would like to get into combat sports and feels like it's a sort of thing that they feel like they've got stuff, you know, I feel like if you've got something to get out of your system or you wanna do a communal um sport activity, you wanna do something recreational where you're using your body, you know, once lockdown is lifted and you feel like joining a club, what would you say as somebody who is looking to join, which like, you know, any kind of martial arts? Dive in. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really intimidating at first, but you'll find that almost every martial arts gym is just so nice. And, and also if it, if it doesn't feel welcoming, there's another, there's, you know, yeah, there's, pennies, there's, so. there's plenty of them. You know, if you if you don't click at the first one in a few weeks, just go somewhere else. Uh, I'd say if you're concerned about being hit, do like a grappling based sport. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is, in my opinion, the best. Um, and if you like hitting things, Muay Thai is the best. And if you like doing everything, do MMA. But uh, don't be intimidated by any of the sports because everyone starts off frightened of them. And, you know, like nobody walks into the gym first thinking that they're a world beater and those that do don't last. So, yeah, just uh, just have a go. Like it, defi- it helped define my growth as a person and uh so would you me. say that it had a really positive impact on your mental health? 100%, yeah. I don't think I could have been who I am now without it. Um. I'm still scared of like being stuck, like fights in the street and stuff. I still avoid it, any kind of conflict, but just like the strength of character it gives you, um, doing that kind of thing is really important. And the camaraderie as well is like a special thing that you only experience when you join a gym like that. Shout out to uh, Spartan Origin and uh, Allegiance. The gyms I've trained at over the years, and also Legacy in uh, Sydney. I was gonna say, can't miss out Legacy. <laughs> yeah, that was a good bunch of gear. So guys. that's it from us this week, I guess. Unless you got anything else you want to add, and uh, the irony of us talking about martial arts while drinking beer. Well, it's lo- lockdown. Lockdown, isn't it? So um, that was. I think that was just like I know it wasn't strictly related to freelance and all work, but I do think it had like a good mental health angle and also something that maybe people are curious about if you're not you can also at the end of this video i'll link some other videos that you might be more interested in around we've talked about um bullying and harassment with lauren we talked about um bereavement and grief with katie all sorts of topics yeah i think it was just a bit of a a bit of a fun one i think if you're going to talk about my freelancing and my business like progression i would never have been who i am without the confidence yeah so it is important like Mm -hmm. having i think any any sport that can give you confidence helps your professional life as well Mm -hmm. that's that's what i have to say that's it from us so we'll see you next week bye Bye.